Great. Well, hi, everybody. After a little bit of technical delay, we are delighted uh, to have you join us during Mitochondrial Disease Awareness Week 2022 for what is one of my favorite events of the year. It is our third annual Mitochondrial Medicine Next Generation Therapeutics panel discussion directly connecting families and pharma. Um, here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, we have made it really our mission to um, bridge from basic uh, to translational research, to clinical research in clinic. And to do that, we need to partner all the way across um, from the families uh, down to the uh, cells and model animals and everybody in between. And I think um, this, in our experience and others, has really led to some exciting prospects. There's wonderful therapies on the horizon. Uh, never has there been more hope to both create the models, evaluate them, and move to clinical trials. Um, I'm aware of more than 50 clinical uh, trial uh, and preclinical uh, companies now um, in the space uh, working to develop therapeutics, um, and it's just a remarkably exciting time. So here tonight, um, if we could advance the slide, um, um, I am delighted to be joined by um, two of my uh, favorite people. Colleen Murescu is our operations director for the clinical and clinical research program at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program. Uh, she helped. Uh, help, she helped us uh, organize and create um, about eight years ago, and helped us grow to now more than sixty people across the entire um, institution, uh, working from lab to clinic and everywhere in between. Um, and I'm very grateful to Phil uh, Yeski, science an alliance officer from the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, uh, who has partnered with us this year uh, to really uh, uh, co-moderate and, and lead this event um, that we are really just so excited um, that these conversations are pivotal uh, to advancing therapies. Um, and I'm very grateful uh, to our development team run by Matt Swear, um, and um, who helped us uh, connect with um, multiple um, bio uh, life science um, companies um, to sponsor um, the work we do here at uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Mitochondrial Medicine Program, our infrastructure, our support for families, our ability to perform small trials and create um, some infrastructure for the preclinical models as well. Uh, tonight, I am uh, delighted to share with you um, our sponsors at the platinum level, Summit Health Pharmacy, at the gold level, Cyclarion, Larimar Therapeutics, IMEL Biotherapeutics and Stealth Biotherapeutics, and at the supporting sponsor level, Reneo Pharmaceuticals and Solus Nutrition. We're grateful to all of them for their support, but most importantly for being here this evening uh, to really share their thoughts and ideas and directly connect with the families. Um, if you go to our website and we'll put it in the chat, the Mitochondrial Medicine uh, Frontier Program. We have a lot of information for families and for partners, including one that I'll highlight, which is our uh, research page. And you can go there and see what sorts of studies we have open to both study the natural history and the outcome measures in patients, as well as increasingly drug trials. Uh, we're delighted that we um, are now um, participating in five pharma sponsored trials. Several are on that page, a few more are about to be announced, and we could probably hold space for about 60 adults right now to enroll in clinical research. Really just a, a huge change um, from what was available in the space um, just, just a few years ago. So uh, like I said, a very exciting time, and I'm gonna turn it over now uh, to um, my partner in crime, uh, Phil Yeski, uh, who is also gonna share his perspective on where we are and how we can partner together more, because it's really gonna take a village, I think, to deliver not just the first therapy, but all the therapies and, and reveal all the ways to help uh, all the patients we follow um, and want to improve their lives. So Phil? Oh, thank, thanks so much, Marnie. Um, Really a, a pleasure to be with everybody uh, today, this evening. Um, you know, Marty's done a great job of setting the stage, the landscape for why we're coming together and why this is such an exciting time for our disease community. Uh, I think we have a great group of panelists today that represent all the various stakeholder groups that make up a robust uh, disease community, the patients, the caregivers, pharmaceutical companies, nutritional companies, uh, pharmacies, right? All, all have a role to play. And uh, hopefully through tonight's uh, discussion in the Q&A session, we'll learn a little bit about where we're at right now, but importantly, set the stage for what's coming. I think that's the next gen 
part of this uh, panel discussion, and that's really where a lot of the exciting stuff is, is taking place. So before we uh, started uh, with the uh, panel discussion, um, you know, in, in talking with Marnie, we, we thought it might be good just to highlight a few projects where collaboration has really been central to the success of these projects and, and really focusing on what CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and UMDF have been able to do together. But I have to say from the get go, all of these projects involve many partners and I'm not going to be able to name all of them. I'm just going to try to shine the light tonight on what's happening with CHOP and UMDF. Uh, but in general, we're not successful unless we broadly partner and remain open to partnership in order to achieve our, our overall goals. So the first project that I wanted to um, mention tonight is MitoShare. And hopefully for the patients and the caregivers that are on uh, the, the webinar this evening, you've heard about MitoShare. We launched it six months ago, and that's meant to be a worldwide patient registry uh, for mitochondrial disease and both patients and caregivers are welcome and we really try to provide uh, both uh, content and engagement opportunities for both of those groups, both patients and for uh, caregivers. But why is it important? Well, patient registry and particularly patient populated registries are the manner in which we capture the patient voice. And it's critical. I think you'll hear this from many of the, the partners from the pharmaceutical side that are on the panel this evening. It's critical that we hear the patient voice and know what's important to the patient community in order to really uh, advance patient-centric therapeutics that are meaningful to the patient community. So that's one important part of why MitoShare is important. How do you benefit from it? Well, certainly we hope the tools that come along with the registry um, are, are useful to you, but one in particular is where we had a chance to partner with CHOP, and that's around genetic testing reports. One of the things we heard in talking to the community before we launched MitoShare is that quite often genetic testing reports can be very confusing uh, to, to patients. They're not written in a patient-friendly way. They're really a clinical report. And so through the registry, we have the opportunity to ask our participants to upload a copy of the report. And then the partnership with CHOP, they provide genetic counselors who curate those reports, meaning they go in, find the most important information, put it into a form that accomplishes two things. One, it gives us a, a really robust research database because that's done consistently and that's important from a research perspective. But for you, the participants, the patients, it's a chance to get a nice summary of the report with lay descriptions of what each of these various components of the report mean. So if you haven't had a chance to check out MitoShare, or even if you had, and you've had genetic testing, please take advantage of this. We're really thankful uh, to CHOP for, for providing such wonderful resources that can look at these reports, quickly assess them, curate them, and, and put these reports together. So thank you to Marnie, Elizabeth, Colleen, and the others that have helped on, on that project. And it's really important that we characterize all these patients, particularly genetically, as we move towards more clinical trials in this space. The second project, which is really a mouthful, the Mitochondrial Disease Sequence Data Resource Consortium. I've been saying it for 10 years and I still stumble over it. So everybody knows it as MSeqDR. And MSeqDR is really a, a brain child of, of Marnie and another collaborator, Jawu Gai. Um, it, it's an effort to um, create a central repository for genomic data. And since Mitochondrial diseases are inherited diseases. It's really important that we understand the genetics behind it. So this is an opportunity to drive a lot of data into a central repository, and then a large suite of software tools have been developed to allow researchers to look at those data in a way that will help find new forms of mitochondrial disease, will help to find diagnoses for patients that perhaps don't have them through their, just uh, through the genetic testing. Ultimately, it's about getting to a diagnosis to improve the clinical care of the patients. So all of these things are important and not least of which therapeutic development, again, the focus of tonight's meeting. Uh, so, you know, how you benefit from it, if you join MitoShare, we are the 
portal, if you will, through which the participants can then participate inside MSeqDR. So again, if you've had genetic testing, you're interested in joining the registry, this is an opportunity to share your data and put it to work to advance research inside mitochondrial disease. So it's a very selfless act, uh, but it's an important one. So we really hope here in the coming weeks to be able to drive a lot of data into MSeqDR to make that an even more powerful tool. So again, thank you, Marnie, for all your contributions uh, through those years, and UMDF is really proud to have supported it. Thank you, Phil. I just wanted to highlight through your vision and Elizabeth McCormick, one of our study coordinators uh, and gene uh, genetic counselors, for the first time ever that I know of, instead of families walking around with a disc and their genetic data asking somebody to look at it for them, they will be able to share it with whomever they want. And they can share it with their doctors, with their researchers, with their clinical trial, whoever they want. So we've created a way to make that data uh, really work for them in a de-identified way that they control who sees it. So that's a project that comes through people enrolled in MitoShare that I want to say it's taken five years to get going because of all of the regulatory, but it's now live um, or about to be, Phil will say. <laughs> uh, all, all the pieces are in place to make that live. So that's, that's something that we did because we knew the families wanted it. They wanted to be able to share their data with people who can solve it or that where it could have other uses for pharmacogenomics or for other genetic diseases in the family. So uh, we're really, really proud to partner with the UMDF on that initi initiative. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Uh, you know, likewise, we have a couple eyes to dot, a few T's to cross, um, but really join MitoShare now. And once you've joined the registry, you'll receive notifications about when the MCDR project is up and ready to, to, to go. Uh, but the genetic uh, test curation is, is available right away. Uh, the last project that I just want to briefly uh, touch upon here before we get to the panel discussion is the Lee Syndrome Natural History uh, Study. Uh, so for those of you on the call that may not be familiar with natural history, that's really about understanding the progression of disease over time. And about four years ago, five patient advocacy groups came together from around the world to form the Lee Syndrome International Consortium. Uh, UMDF is a proud partner of that, together with uh, people against Lee syndrome here in the United States, Lilly Foundation in the UK, Mitocon in Italy, and Mito Foundation in Australia. Collectively, our five patient advocacy groups raised one million dollars to put towards this project, one million US dollars. And as you start to think about, okay, what are the most important things we can do to really move the needle for Lee syndrome research? Uh, clearly, there's there's a lot of research that needs to be done there, but the absence of natural history data was something we heard over and over again from researchers and from pharmaceutical companies that were interested in working in this space. So over the last several years and through the pandemic, which definitely made things challenging, we've tried to develop a collection of assessments that Lee syndrome patients who join this study uh, will pass through every time they come in for clinical care. And over time, we then build up an idea of how disease changes. And this is the so-called natural history. Again, critical uh, for the successful development of therapeutics. So CHOP is the first site that is active inside this project. They've already recruited at least 20 patients, perhaps a few more. And I know they could bring even more to it, but we really want this to be a global project so now we're building out the same sort of contracts with other sites around the world uh, to allow other patients to, to participate in it. So with the funds we have available to us right now, we hope to be able to follow 150 Lee syndrome patients for at least three years. And three years should mean 10 to 12 clinical evaluations. That's a lot of data points that will provide tremendous insights into what it means to have Lee syndrome and how that progresses over time. This is not about any one form of Lee syndrome. There are many, many mutations, many, many types of Lee syndrome. So as long as you have a genetic a diagnosis of Lee syndrome, you're eligible to participate in this study. So if you're interested, and particularly if CHOP is uh, your, where you receive your clinical care, please uh, talk to Marnie, Amy, and the team there about the possibility. This is yet another way where your data 
enables the advancement of research and the development of treatments and cures. So thanks in advance to those of you on the call who are maybe already participating in this. And I really hope over time we have the chance to sustain this and grow it to more patients, even different types of mitochondrial disease in a very similar way, <clears throat> just to advance our, our overall goals. So that's just a snapshot of three places where CHOP and, and UMDF work very closely together, again, with a lot of other partners, all of whom we're very thankful for. But tonight, it's really about hearing your questions and trying to answer them in a way so you have a sense of where we're at with therapeutic development. So I'm going to pause there. And Colleen, I don't know if you want to take the screen back over or if you just want to leave this up, but we can get started with our, our panel tonight. Excellent. I will share just so we can do brief introductions so everyone is aware of who's on the call. And if we want to get started with our family panelists, David, Vaughn, do you want to start us off? Sure, yes. Uh, I, I'm very excited to be here. My name is David Fawn. I am the father of an 11 year old named Catherine who has a form of mitochondrial complex one disorder caused by mutations in her NUBPL gene. Uh, Catherine was diagnosed with uh, mito disease when she was three, so we've been living with this for about eight years now. Um, we have participated in the EPI-743 clinical trial through the NIH. Um, also through the NIH, we've been involved in some other research into the efficacy of vaccinations in mito patients. Um, we are funding research at CHOP into um, potential clinical treatments, therapeutics for the NUBPL form of the disease and also a natural history study. Thank you, David. Casey Wallivan, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, Hi. I can hear you. <laughs> Hi, my son was uh, diagnosed in 2014 and my husband and I scoured the internet looking for the experts in, in, in Lee syndrome. And we found Marnie in 2016. And since then she has been, or I should say the clinic, CHOPS uh, Mitochondrial Medicine Clinic has been instrumental in keeping our son um, healthy and researching his particular mutation, which is the SURF1 mutation in Lee syndrome. Uh, we have, you know, funded research through CHOP. We are just, I'm excited to be here on this panel uh, amongst great uh, people. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Casey. And maybe, maybe Casey, you've, you've done a little bit more. You've created a little bit of a, of a foundation yourself. Do you want to comment? Right. So yes, <laughs> I, I, we were inspired and, and we created our own uh, foundation called Cure Mito Foundation, and we are focused on Lee syndrome. So if anybody's interested, hop on over uh, to our website and and check it out. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. And David Adams, our second David. Yeah, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, yeah, hi, my name is David Adams. I'm, uh, 50, I'm uh, 52. Um, I have dominant aptic atrophy uh, with plus phenotypes, uh, including uh, my, my mitochondrial myopathy. Uh, I've, uh, I, plan, uh, I was in the uh, RTA 408 uh, study uh, about five, five to six years ago. Thank you. Thank you, David. And Dr. Goldstein? Sorry, I was looking for the unmute button. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there um, with the technical difficulties at the beginning. We're really pleased to be on this session together. 
Um, I'm the clinical director of the mitochondrial program at CHOP. Um, and so I oversee the outpatient clinic and with my partner, Matt Demsko, we oversee the inpatient side. And I am um, thrilled um, to be part of this panel because in my other role, I also am one of the physician leads for several of the clinical trials. And it is after being in this field for years, it is thrilling to be able to have a conversation about clinical trials. What can we offer our patients having more than one option? Um, and so I really want to thank, um, uh, first of all, Marnie Falk for putting this together, Phil Yeski for leading the UMDF, um, and just and, and everyone who he is here from Pharma, so that the families who have joined us um, have the benefit of hearing this conversation. And so I think it's just wonderful. And this is how we make progress together. So thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a clinical research project manager um, for our mitochondrial medicine team here at CHOP. Um, uh, we s collaborate very closely with our life science partners, different um, uh, medical institutions and pharmaceutical companies to drive progress for our patients. Um, in addition to that, um, not, not only do we lead and develop clinical trials um, for our patient population, I also like to think that our clinical research group also serves as personal patient advocates or a bridge for um, the patients that we see um, every day in clinic, um, helping them support their their needs and their wants in, in the future of uh, clinical research and different uh, trials as well. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. And going to our life science partners, not in any particular order, Anthony from Stealth. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Anthony Abrascato. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Development at Stealth Biotherapeutics. Um, I'm a pharmacist by background, practicing pharmacist for about five years before transitioning to the industry. Um, I've been with a, a three different companies uh, spanning both big pharma and smaller biotech companies. I've been with Stealth for about five and a half years now, um, and I'm involved in pretty much all of our development programs and I can't thank the organizers enough for uh, putting this together. I think it's an excellent forum. Um, one thing I've learned is it really takes everyone to develop, uh, you know, new medications for rare disease, rare diseases, and especially mitochondrial diseases. So I'm very excited at, at this opportunity. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Vince from Summit. Get it, Vince. Maybe I can help you. You can come back to Vince. How about Tom from Solace? Any difficulty? All right, we're going to keep on going. Alex from Reneo, I do see your video on. Can you hear me? I can. Excellent. So my name is Alex Dorenbaum. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Reneo Pharmaceutical, and Reneo is dedicated to tackling uh, the mitochondrial myopathies and other myopathies related to genetic diseases. Uh, we are conducting clinical trials both in the U.S. and uh, ex-U.S., and um, uh, looking forward to this discussion. Thank you for being here. Dory from IML. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Dory Pellet, and I'm uh, serving as the Chief Operating Officer of uh, IML Biotherapeutics, uh, biochemist by training. Uh, IML is uh, developing a cell based uh, therapy in the US and elsewhere. Uh, first product is targeted at uh, primary mitochondrial disease, at, uh, and it's at its early development stages meaning that we are running now mostly non-clinical uh, studies. We did do a study with uh, Molly that we hope she will uh, publish uh, soon, and you'll see how everything Philip said uh, earlier about uh, monitoring a, a patient for over time it could be very helpful. So I'm very excited to be on this day discussion. Thank you, Dory. And then last but not least, Chris from Cyclarion. Hi, I'm Chris Winter. I'm the Vice President of Translational Medicine at Cyclarion and very happy to be here presenting and discussing on behalf of a, a great team at Cyclarion. Um, we are a company that's in the Boston area. Uh, we are focused on the nitric oxide 
uh, soluble guanylate cyclase pathway. Uh, many of you might be familiar with nitric oxide and, and uh, uh, mitochondrial disease, and we have recently completed a study in MELOS, um, patients with MELOS, and we're very happy to read out some exciting data earlier this uh, summer in June, uh, actually with, with UMDF, and um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, in particular to the, the hard work of the clinicians, uh, some of whom are on the uh, discussion today and, and the call, uh, and also certainly to the patients and, and their families. Uh, it's been a fantastic opportunity to work closely and, and really I think it's, it's events like these where we get a chance to uh, come together and learn from each other and, and learn what matters most to patients and their families and some of the challenges that we're all facing uh, and, and really excited to be participating today. So thank you. So thank you all. Bill, do you want to kick off with the first part sure. of the Q&A? Oh, no, absolutely. And you know, a, a panel focused on therapeutics um, doesn't go anywhere without patient involvement. So I thought maybe a good starting point. Uh, Dave Adams, I, I believe you shared with us that you were a part of a clinical trial. Maybe you could just share with the audience a little bit about, you know, some of that process. Like, you know, were you hesitant in, in any way to participate in a clinical trial? Um, were there aspects of of uh, being part of a clinical trial that maybe you had to be educated on in order to understand. I, I think it would be really helpful for those that might be listening in that haven't participated in a clinical trial to hear from someone that has. Right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was very uh, uh, I, I. So you have to. Uh, sorry, having some issues here. I was, uh, <clears throat> I didn't have any uh, hesitations uh, about uh, getting into the trial. I'm a uh, farm, pharmaceutical R&D toxicologist, so mm -hmm. I know a lot about uh, clinical trials. Uh, so I was very, uh, I, I was very, uh, uh, very, so sorry. I, I have to, I had a, a stroke a few uh, months ago and I'm, I'm still, I'm still uh, walk, working with speech therapy. So take, take uh, your time. Sorry on that. Uh, yeah, so I, I really loved uh, working uh, with Col Colleen and uh, the team at CHOP. Uh, you know, they helped me uh, us uh, with the genetics to actually uh, get my uh, genetic uh, testing uh, to get me into the trial. Uh, be before uh, that happened, uh, I, I wasn't 100% uh, 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 known that I had uh, the OPA1 uh, 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 gene. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, once I got onto the trial, it was it was uh, a great uh, uh, it was a great uh, uh, a great uh, explain explain. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. But I think it was a good experience for you. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It was a great experience. Uh, you know, uh, I guess just the one thing I I, I never uh, uh, found out about was whether I was on the placebo or uh, the the drug. Right. Uh, I guess I would have. It would be nice to to know that at some point. I I did. Uh, you know, read the literature, and uh, I noticed that the uh, the uh, it, it the the drug didn't meet uh, meet its uh, uh, endpoint. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. So so that was uh, you know a bit uh, not you know it, that was. Uh, I think it can be disappointing right, for, for, for patients that really put a lot of effort and time into participating in the trial only to have it fail. Exactly. But this is a really important 
uh, consideration, right? That has to be acknowledged. There, you know, it's research. Clinical trials are research, and um, many clinical trials fail. Um, so, being in a clinical trial does not guarantee that there will be a successful um, drug at the end of it. I think earlier I mentioned about a selfless act of 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 sharing your data. In many ways, a clinical trial is the ultimate selfless act. You may not directly benefit or your loved one but you're doing something incredibly important for future generations um, by helping to learn how various drugs uh, uh, do work inside the human body. Uh, so thank right. you for, for, for doing that, Dave. And you know, another important point you uh, called out is around genetics and the importance of having a diagnosis. Colleen, maybe for you and Sarah, or maybe you just want to talk a little bit about eligibility criteria and what you go through whenever you're trying to bring patients into a clinical trial. Sarah, I'll let you take that one. We lose Sarah, possibly. <laughs> ah. Well, and thinking about you know, genetic testing, I will say, you know, some drug trials do offer a portion of genetic testing to be paid for. And that's fortunately how we were able to help Dave get into the trial. Uh, but that's really a key pivotal thing, which can be also frustrating for patients when, you know, they don't have a genetic diagnosis. So it's a double edged sword. We need to target the right patient population uh, that these drugs could be beneficial for. But we, there's also a host of other patients that are maybe still searching for their genetic answers. So finding other opportunities and partnerships. And I know UMDF has, you know, a great program now offering genetic testing eligibility, right. eligibility for patients. There are a lot of pharma companies that are still offering some portion of testing with some of their trials, as well as more opportunities. Testing's only coming down in pricing. So hopefully we'll continue to advance that um in that area no i think you're absolutely right colleen uh, you know there are there are barriers i think we have to acknowledge those and accept those and we're trying to understand them umdf did some surveying in the spring and we shared some of the data at our symposium when we were out in phoenix in this past june uh, just trying to understand what are the barriers for patient participation what are the barriers for clinicians and, and, and institutions to participate in, in clinical trials? And ultimately, what are the barriers for pharmaceutical companies to perhaps come into the mitochondrial disease space? Uh, like we, we have to unearth all of these and then look for solutions because it's only the interplay of all those stakeholders that ultimately will lead to development of treatments and cures. So I think you're going to see more of this and we have to try to design programs and to address it. And one of the ones you mentioned is you know, we still have a shortage of patients that are well characterized, particularly from a genotype point of view, knowing the, the genetic mutation, uh, the pathology underneath their mitochondrial disease. So I think sponsored genetic testing programs is one way we can try to facilitate getting patients who otherwise might not be able to access genetic testing a chance to get the diagnosis that they they really need in order to be to be able to participate and have optimal clinical care. Phil and, and Colleen, if I may, um, one of the things that um, I think um, Dave David mentioned was it's disappointing when the trial fails, and I think it's disappointing for everybody the the sites and the pharma. But we know that it's a it's a it's a, it's a possibility, and we know that it happens commonly. One of what things that we've tried to do to support the families and the pharma is to collect data, as you said, prospectively um, on all of our patients all of the time. And I wonder, and um, and also partner, as as Dory said from Amel, you know, to share that information with the pharma companies so that they can be informed of the subpopulations that might best respond to enhance the number of responders and remove the number of people that might be harmed. And we worked with some of you about it. And I was wondering if maybe Sarah Nguyen and Amy Goldstein might comment because they've been involved now with many partners because our goal is to sort of stack the decks if we can. Of course, we can't influence the ultimate, you know, will it work or not, but can we design the most efficient, cost-effective, likely to succeed trial based upon either preclinical or 
data analysis of patients' data from the very valuable time they're in clinic and their genetics. So Amy and, Colleen, and Sarah have worked really hard on this to design better trials that capture outcomes so that we'll have less disappointment and more successes. That's what we want to see. So I don't know if they want to comment. Yeah, I think we've been able to have really good, successful, po positive um, collaborations, ongoing collaborations with the life partners um, and our sponsors, and they're very receptive to our feedback and our criticism and and, and just constructive um, brainstorming. And I think the immediate takeaways in improving in patient enrollment and meaningful experience for our patients is um, obviously prioritizing safety monitoring, um, supporting travel logistics, uh, and then also um, removing intensive or high burden procedures just making the, the the clinical trial as effective as possible but at the same time as safe and uh low burden uh low intensive procedures for the patient as well um i i i've seen that reverberate especially uh very uh well over the past two or three clinical trials where we've been able to have the, the eligibility criteria or some of the procedures evolve in the benefit of our, our patients. And that really was a tremendous boon to um, having new people and having new patients um, enter our clinical trials. You know, Sarah, I think that really underscores the importance of <clears throat> pharmaceutical companies interested in mitochondrial disease or considering developing a therapeutic for mitochondrial disease partnering with patients and patient advocacy groups very early in the process so that you can begin uh, an interplay or a discussion around um, you know what what are the burdens associated with how the trial is being designed how do you put forward a protocol or a, or a study that accomplishes the goals necessary to get regulatory approval but acknowledges this is what's most important to the patients and it's also done in a patient friendly way and i know all of the participants in today's panel have done that and we're really thankful for that that's the message we need to be sending out is talk to the patients through the patient advocacy groups early so that we can design better studies and i'll just mention sarah talked about the ongoing communication you know so with some of the recent clinical trials, we had very slow enrollment and it was not just at our site, it was across the world. And of course, some of that was COVID related, right? Patients did not want to travel. Um, and so we brainstormed ways to make um, some of the visits either home visits or video visits. So we had to brainstorm with that. Um, but then, you know, other things like what were the barriers for patients not wanting to come for a clinical trial? And in one case, it was that people did not want to get a spinal tap. And so we talked to the company and they said, OK, then we'll make the spinal tap optional. This doesn't need to be a requirement. So that helps some patients feel more at ease to come in. Um, but the other thing, um, there's a couple things that I wanted to say about this. You know, I think what's really important for us all to, to recognize is that we we want to know what the what the how the drug works so that we can try to guess what symptom is this going to actually fix? What tissues is it getting into and what symptoms should we be tracking? And um, for some of our patients, you know, there are some exclusion criteria, meaning that, you know, you can't have severe heart disease, you can't have severe kidney disease, you can't have severe diabetes. Um, but for some of these trials, we would go back to the company and say, well, we actually think that those are the important patients to be including. So let's work on this a little bit more, maybe change again some of the numbers and allow a few more patients in, um, as long as, as as Sarah pointed out, safety was a huge concern. Um, but we also, when we're doing the outcome measures at CHOP, I'm very, very careful that we're also writing down what the patients are telling us so that in case it's not captured with one of the outcome measures, we're still collecting that information for a future trial. So, for example, if the patient says, well, I feel much more awake, um, but meanwhile, we're doing six minute walk tests and things like that, then in the back of my mind, I'd start thinking, how are we going to measure this wakefulness, right? Do we need to add an Epworth sleep, sleep net, uh, sleepy diary or, you know, things like that. So I'm thinking about what are the next scales that we can use? Because what we, what we see happening now is one trial ends and maybe we didn't um, meet good endpoints or the drug appeared to fail, um, but 
we have a, a small cohort of patients that said, hold on a second, I, I improved with this. And then to go back and say, all right, maybe that's the population we need to be narrowed in on. And um, and I think we're seeing that there's not going to be a one size fits all for all patients and all symptoms, but we want to be really smart about this drug is going to work on this population of people for this symptom. And there hopefully we'll have many drugs within our within our armamentarium when we're done. Amy, we're, we're in a really fortunate situation to have some of our partners on the call. I wonder if anybody from Pharma wants to speak about what you just said about pivoting or about, you know, trial. Um, you know, I think Phil is the one who taught me the phrase, many shots on goal. So <laughs> one failed phase three does not mean a drug did not work. I wonder if any of the companies want to comment on that, um, you know, and how much sort of resiliency the companies need as much as the families to get to approvals and how we, we kind of have a culture of continual learning and, and sharing. Does anybody want to speak to that? Chris? I, I can I can start. I think it's you have to be resilient in this in this business for sure. And I think as a parent of a child with a rare disease, you have to be resilient as a parent too. And I think we realize that um, it goes frustratingly slow at times. Um, but I think there are a number of reasons why that is. And one is, you know, focus on safety and focus on regulatory approaches that need to be in place to, to make sure that things are done properly and carefully. Um, I think it's a learning process. As Amy pointed out, you know, we learn as we go through these studies um, where where drugs might find their best impact. And I think it really is that iterative process that helps us to move things forward. Um, and, and I think it also is, uh, as you point out, listening to ways to design the next set of studies. So you learn from this study, where are we going to have the potential for the best impact? What scales should we be building in? And what conversations are we having with regulators and foundations and families to, to make sure that next study is the most impactful and, and tells us where this medicine uh, can, can grow? So I, I think it is, you know, frustratingly slow, um, you know, for everybody involved, but um, you know, it's also backed by people who are doing a lot of work and spending a lot of long hours to try and bring these therapies forward. And, and I think, uh, um, you know, it's 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 an exciting place to be uh, when, when data starts to come forward, too. So. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Anthony Abrascato. Agree with everything that's been said. Um, I just want to say from the stealth perspective, we've learned so much from our own failures that help to guide you know, where we can go in the future. And, and Dr. Goldstein, what you said about, you know, uh, specific anecdotes that you might hear, unfortunately, there can be a disconnect between an endpoint that has regulatory value and endpoints that are actually meaningful for the patient. So, um, you know, when designing a clinical trial, you really try to capture both so that if you do fail, you have the ability to keep digging and it gives, you know, everyone um, you know, us as the sponsor company, the patients, the confidence to, you know, keep pushing forward and uh, figuring out the right path forward. So agree with everything that's been said. And I wonder, Anthony, can you give us a little bit more? Because you just opened a new trial. We're one of your partners, but it, it, it's an exact, an exact example of what you're saying. Do you want to explain? Yeah, absolutely. So back in 2000, end of 2019, we had a, a failed uh, phase three clinical trial. So it was a it was a basket trial. We really enrolled all comers, um, uh, many different underlying genotypes and even phenotypes within um, the diagnosis of uh, mitochondrial myopathy and six minute walk test, um, as well as a, a, a PRO, a patient reported outcome assessment questionnaire were our primary endpoints and um, neither of those endpoints uh, uh, met our, our criteria for significance. Uh, but sure enough, we um, spent time digging through the data, speaking with um, you know, our, our uh, investigator partners as well as um, other stakeholders within the community. And we were able to uh, identify a, a subgroup of genetic patients who responded to the treatment. So. Um, as Dr. Falk just mentioned, we uh, just opened a, a new phase three trial focusing on that specific subgroup where we're confident we'll see an effect. Yeah, and actually, I, you know, as Marty said, that's a really good example of learning from our, our failures and moving forward and trying to put together a better study. Um, 
you know, Alex, uh, you know, I think maybe, you know, this is a chance for, for you to weigh in on also learning, right, from those who've come before you in the mitochondrial disease space, and how do you focus in on the cohort, the group of patients that you want to try to address? Maybe you could speak to that process. Well, for, first, I'll, I'll say this, and, and I think that Anthony may not know this, but when we were entering uh, the, the space of mitochondrial myopathies, was uh, uh, around the time that that stealth uh, was um, uh, announcing the, the the results of their trial and um, of course we were very concerned and we actually called the chief medical officer at stealth and uh, and chatted with him and and he was really nice he 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 spent time telling us about what he what his thoughts were and 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 gave us advice on 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 where we needed to focus and what he felt uh, was important for us to consider. So you, you know you often hear that companies are trying to undermine each other in, in the process, but but that was not the case uh, with with Stealth. On the contrary, uh, Stealth was uh, to the extent that it was they were able to tell us. Uh, give us information, they gave us the information that, that they felt comfortable giving us. And that was actually very helpful in us designing our trial. Uh, it, there is a big tension between what each of us does. Uh, you know, it, it's clear that, that patients and patients' families have to advocate for their care as much as they can. And that rightfully is their primary concern. I think that physicians start having more of a conflict. Uh, you want to treat your patient, but you also want to learn and advance the science, and that creates, to some degree, some so, so, some greater conflict because you know that you have to learn through processes that may or may not necessarily always benefit the patient, like doing a double-blind placebo-controlled trial where you know half of the patients may end up getting a placebo, but still you need to learn. And it's very important to get that learning so that we can solve problems uh, in the future. And then us as, 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 as physicians working or researchers working in industry, we have the, yet the other conflict that uh, we need to find a solution for the patients, but we need to present it in a way that is appealing to the regulatory agencies like the FDA, and that creates yet another conflict. And 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 I think that the the, the stealth example is a very good example where uh, stealth probably tried to find a solution for all the patients with PMM, and realized that the intervention may be helpful just for a segment of that population. But how do you figure that out if you don't do the research? Uh, uh, so so so. So, so to me, you know, there are tensions that exist in all this process that can only be resolved by us all working together, as, as you have all said before. I think that one thing that was highlighted today that uh, it's a take a home message for me is uh, David Adams uh, mentioned that he participated in a trial that uh, it, he felt that it benefited him uh, in, in, in some ways, even though the study may not have been successful. But he also said that he wished he had learned uh, whether he was in the treatment arm or in the placebo arm. And I think that that that's, you know, a failure of all of us not communicating those things. And, and to me, that's an important message that, that I think we all need to take home. Uh, we, we need to acknowledge that as we are doing these things, that as we are doing this research, uh, human lives are at stake and human, you know, days of people are at stake. Every day that I delay my study, if my study is not successful, every day that I delay my study is a day that patients receive treatment that wasn't successful. And if my study is successful, every day I delay, I'm delaying treatment for patients who may benefit from my treatment. So uh, at, at times we don't we don't understand that urgency. And I think it's very important that we all understand that urgency. And we struggle with getting our studies enrolled fast enough. But also we want to enroll them with the right patients so that we can find the answer. So so I, I think that 
it should invigorate us to having these discussions to go back and to try to populate the studies as fast as possible, answer the questions as fast as possible with rigorous science so that we can move forward with either positive results or even negative results. I, I wonder, um, Alex or the rest of the team, to follow up what you said, can you explain to the families whether you need to have a, a drug approved on every single indication in order to get it FDA approved versus getting it approved on one indication and then being able to use it and get it um, manufactured properly and then in the post-market phase four, you can learn more. Can you explain this concept? Because I think it's, it's key and I'm not sure um, it's really clear to everybody. I'm, I'm happy to tackle that. So the environments are different in different places and there are two different issues at stake related to what you mentioned, which is if a drug is approved, can that drug be used for other indications? And you know, there are drugs that are out there that are that are uh, very available and easy to get hold of that people can use for, for, for almost anything. For example, a good example is steroids. Steroids were never approved to treat COVID, yet during the COVID pandemic, doctors started treating patients with steroids because it kind of made sense to do that based on what they were seeing. Uh, uh, that, that is not that difficult to do, but the problem with drugs in orphan diseases is that they tend to be relatively expensive. And if you want to use that drug, the insurance company has to pay for it. And very often insurance companies will not want to pay for a drug for which there is no clear uh, 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 evidence of benefit shown by an approval. And that seems to be more actually more rigorous in Europe than in the US, for example. In the US, even if a drug is not approved for your disease, your doctor can write a letter and explain why he thinks the drug is going to help you. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes, can get that drug approved for you to be treated with it and the insurance will pay for it. But it does, it, so, so generally speaking, Drugs should be used for the indications or diseases that they were approved for. And that is the general rule. If a drug is not approved for a certain condition, it shouldn't be used for that condition. There are circumstances in which one can cross that line. Uh, now, particularly in PMM, what I can tell you is this. Because we are making the case that the patients that have mitochondrial gene defects have disease that is relatively different from the patients that have nuclear gene defects, for example, is very likely that if we were successful and our store drug was only evaluated in mitochondrial gene defects, that, uh, that insurance companies in the United States would not pay for treatment of patients with nuclear gene defects. So if we want to treat patients with nuclear gene defects with our medicine, we will need to do research with our medicine in patients with nuclear defects. We actually are actually planning a study and what we're, we're worried about is that in, in the adult population, the nuclear defects are not as common as in in, in, in children, for example, and it, it's difficult to find patients to participate in trials and Stealth is doing a study, Astellas is doing a st study, we want to do a study. So all of a sudden, you know, it, it becomes a little difficult to, to, to execute those clinical trials. Have I addressed your question? Sure. I mean, it's such a it's such a rich topic, right? How do you pick an outcome and do you need to pick them all and do you need to pick the, the right population? But I think understanding how pharma thinks about it is really helpful for families to understand because then a failure is not necessarily a failure, right? A failure helps you pinpoint who might, you know, benefit. And and I think I think Dr. Goldstein said it best. We want an armamentarium of therapy. We want to model cancer. There's not one therapy for cancer. There's many, many. And I think we're sort of at the memory game of uncovering kind of like what all the right therapies will be and who they match with. So I, I really, like I said, commend commend all of you for, for working with us on, on this incredibly important initiative. And if you think about mitochondrial diseases, I, I, I believe that there are already 
hundreds of genes that have been identified that under that that can cause uh, you know alterations in the function of the mitochondria so so it, it would follow that therapies that are very specific for certain biological cellular processes will work in some patients but may not work in others that don't have that specific defect so so i think that what we're, we're, we're the more and, and that's work generally that is not necessarily done by pharma that's work that is generally done and uh, by, by, by by researchers in the universities and that is actually a big plug for the two programs field that you were talking about earlier uh, you know the, the more the, the more that the more that that chop gets different mutations and can associate those mutations to how those patients presented and what kind of problems they have, the more is it that we will be able to then tailor medicines to try to tackle each of those groups of patients. Thank you, Alex. I will, I do want to get to one of the questions that was pre-submitted to both David, Fawn and Casey. Um, if you want to get some patient perspective on they asked, what was your most profound realization during the clinical trial process or even during the natural history studies you participated in? David Fawn, if you want to take it first, or, and then Casey. Um, th thank you very much. Um, th that, that's a difficult question. I don't know what the, the most profound realization was. Um, I, I do want to say that overall, the experience was nothing but positive for us. Um, even though the clinical trial we were in was Epi 743 and it didn't meet its endpoints, and that was disappointing. Um, but nevertheless, I think uh, the, the experience was positive and it helped us in ways we never expected. Um, you know, when you're going through the process, the, the pharmaceutical companies are very rigorous about monitoring your health, and they have these different goals and endpoints in mind to, to try to get the drug approved. Um, and when you go through the, the the clinical trial, your your patient, my daughter, is you're constantly getting uh, examined, neuropsych exams, and and heart exams, and and different kinds of physical exams. And we were surprised at how much this ended up helping us in other areas outside the clinical trial. Um, for example, the entire neuropsych process was instrumental in my daughter's uh, IEP at school. I mean, it, it couldn't have been a more important uh, aspect of, of the trial that we, we just never expected to come out of that. We, you know, her IEP is even today, years after the trial is over, is, is still uh, still geared toward a lot of things we learned during the, that process. So it, it's important to us clinically in ways that I never expected. Um, I, I do think maybe more related to the question itself, um, the process was enlightening for us um, because we we thought the the drug helped my daughter in certain ways, but we didn't meet the endpoints. And you start to realize when you're going through the process that designing these clinical trials has got to be extremely difficult. Um, you know what you set as the endpoint um, has to be very very hard. It's hard to figure out. You're dealing with progressive diseases. Um, you're dealing with a lot of times fairly small patient populations. A lot of times very limited um, natural history studies. So how do you even set an endpoint to say this drug works or doesn't work under those conditions? It's, it, it's hard to know. It's, I mean, for, for us with a progressive disease, if my daughter continues to get worse, maybe we don't meet your endpoint, but if she gets worse more slowly, it's huge to us as a family. So it, it's sometimes, you know, when, when you're going through this, it's enlightening and sometimes in our case, a little bit disappointing when you think things are, are working, but you don't meet whatever the goals were 
that the pharmaceutical companies have set and and you know you've got to meet the science um and sometimes you have to like you're saying you have to pivot because sometimes maybe you realize your goals or endpoints weren't the right ones to meet and you've got to pivot and 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 change but i, I think that was sort of a profound uh, profound lesson we learned is just because you think it may be working doesn't even mean that you've met your your endpoints and the drug may not get approved. Yeah, Dave, you've had about a, a dozen really important points <laughs> inside that response, and you probably saw some heavy nodding from the uh, pharmaceutical uh, representatives on the call around the challenges of being able to plant a flag somewhere, right? Because you have to, from a regulatory point of view, you know, say this is what our endpoint's going to be in the full knowledge that there's a, a spectrum of outcomes possible and that some of those outcomes may not meet the endpoints to satisfy the FDA, but are meaningful to the patient. And this is a, a really challenging part of uh, therapeutic uh, development. And um, I applaud your uh, willingness to to share that aspect of it because I think we that's part of the paying it forward to the rest of the community that haven't had that experience to understand and prepare yourself for uh, what will undoubtedly be an emotional roller coaster regardless of the outcome. And, and as uh, I guess another thing that's also difficult as a patient is to what degree are the things you're seeing. Um, just the natural clinical progression of your disease, to what degree are you just uh, seeing your own hope and maybe you're hoping that that's an improvement when maybe it, it's it's not, doesn't meet the rigors necessary to get FDA approval. And it, it's a, that's a difficult process to go through as a patient because sometimes what you're seeing, maybe you're not, maybe it's, you know, uh, confirmation bias, maybe it's just, Pure, pure love and hope. Yeah, well, that's part of the reason for I, blinding, right? Sorry to, to jump in here, but I just want to uh, make a comment. That's why it is so important to join natural history studies. It's important to join clinical trials and not, just so we know what endpoints to look for, right? So if, if patients don't involve or get involved, then we'll never know what are meaningful endpoints to look for are. So it's important for all of us to come together, the patients, and and want to improve this and want to, to get a cure or treatment. It, it starts with us, actually, you know, so do the natural history studies, do the registries, do them all, because that's how we're going to find proper endpoints for these clinical trials. So I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> no. Yeah, I can't. I, I couldn't can't agree more. That that's enough. absolutely yeah. critical. <laughs> yeah. That's right. This this is what we can contribute, right? Oftentimes, Thanks. patient asks, like, "What what can I do?" This is what you can do is to to be engaged. Exactly. I I would just say that there is um, just from the the development side, there are different types of trials too, right? So some trials, like the one we ran, was an earlier trial. It was what's called an open label trial. Everybody gets drug. We look at a number of different endpoints because we were not really sure where we might have the best impact. And then you can sort of use that to guide your next set, which could be a registrational trial, which you're going to the FDA with the evidence and saying, these are the endpoints where we believe our drug has an effect. And so I think it's really, you know, Casey and David, you make great points. That's exactly where we want to go and, and learn and, and figure out where we can have the biggest impact. And I, I think just to that point, Chris, one of the things we've learned talking with the FDA is every patient experience matters, even if it's in an, an open access or an IND, like we spoke about during the education event today, every every drug day matters. So I, I don't think any of it's lost. And I, I think some of you, including Phil, participated in an, um, a paper, an effort earlier this year that was published by, by many of the companies and academic groups and advocacy saying, you know, all that data that is coming from trials, even the placebo, it's valuable. And so the community, the way you spoke so highly of each other sharing, that sort of sharing, and I, I don't know if Phil wants to say more, you know, is something that we can do to advance knowledge of disease um, that, you know, can expedite the process, as Alex was saying. 
That's right. Every every patient data point, you know, invaluable, and and so we have to do all we can to to build upon those, right, and 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 improve upon it in the next study, no, no matter what the out, outcome is. Um, I'm seeing that. Um, you know, I think uh, you know someone that's been very active in our community for a long time is Matt Klein from PTC Therapeutics, formerly Edison. And he was really the first one that talked to me, at least, about creating a culture of clinical trials, right? And it really is a culture, uh, a culture of the patients realizing this is a role they can play and they need to be engaged because absent patients, you can't run clinical trials. It's a culture for the companies themselves in terms of understanding the burden of mitochondrial disease in its many different forms. And certainly for the clinicians and the institutions, what they face uh, in terms of running that. So um, we're still in the early days of what I would characterize as our clinical era. We don't have approved therapeutics for mitochondrial disease yet, but as we progress this, that culture is what the foundation we need to create so that much like a flywheel as we get started and we have a success, uh, we can really drive three successes off of that, then 10 and, and the many different therapeutics, all the shots on goal, Marnie, as I, I like to say, that we need to be able to help our, our mitochondrial disease patients. Colleen, was there another area you wanted to address? I didn't know if you still were looking to wrap up here at the 6.30. I think we can go if people are willing to stay on another five or 10 minutes. I think we were hoping to be done by about 6.40, 6.45, and it's such an unbelievable opportunity, and I think amount of effort on all of your parts to be here that if whoever is able to stay, I think it just benefits all of us to learn from you. Uh, so if maybe we can go. I know we have a few more questions. Colleen? Yeah. I was going to say the other question and topic that have come up that we've briefly touched on, but maybe Dr. Goldstein and Sarah can elaborate for our families as well as partners, some barriers to sites and participation in trial. What, why we some sites can participate, why they might not be able to participate. I'm sorry, can you repeat yeah. the question? Sites? Like uh, barriers for sites, like clinical sites participating. Oh. Sure. Um, I might let Sarah um, actually start if she doesn't mind, because I know, you know, I, what I know is that if there's a patient there, Sarah or one of the other coordinators will say, can you come here then? And, you know, me trying to be in two places at once is something that I'm still not I still haven't mastered, but I try really hard. Um, but, you know, I mean, obviously the clinician availability is one barrier, right? Um, and just where are you going to fit it in between a busy day where you're seeing outpatients in clinic, then there's inpatients and ER patients and, and so on. Um, but, but I, you know, I, I feel like I do this much in terms of what has to happen to orchestrate it. Um, Sarah's on the other end, which is, you know, certainly talking with Dr. Falk, looking at the budget and then figuring out, do we have the right people, the right equipment, the right setup um, to, to perform the trial? So Sarah, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I think with CHOP being um, CHOP, it's in our reputation. I think we've been very fortunate to have robust, um, a robust amount of interest and in, in patients who um, are motivated to enroll and, and complete study visits according um, to protocol timelines. Um, I, I think to, to start off with some positive uh, facts, like we, we have study patients as far as uh, Wisconsin, Missouri, Kansas. So geographically, I think if patients are very motivated, they'll come from wherever. Um, over the weekend, I actually got an email from a MILAS patient who wants to enroll into one of our clinical trials and they're located in Dublin, Ireland. And, and it's actually not unusual for me to get um, interest from other parts of the world. I think logistically, it's not so much the distance or the lo um, location of sites. I think sometimes it's the frequency of visits. Patients don't mind flying to, um, uh, to a site um, once every three or four months, but I think once, once, if their study visits are very clustered close together, if all that flying back and forth, I think is very physically, mentally taxing, even if there is um, financial and, and travel support for our patients. So I don't think, I think broadly, I don't think geograph, 
geography or location is a big barrier for at least for our site. I think um, it's the 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 life admin and the, and the sequencing and the frequency of visits that can sometimes be a lot for patients. And and I think that's one of probably a primary site challenge um, universally. Um, and then to fortunately, I think um, as we as clinical trials continue to evolve, having home nursing home visits has been a great um, uh, has been a tremendous advantage um, uh, for for families as well who who ha they're able to be safely monitored in the comfort of their home and not have to actually travel to Philadelphia for a full day visit. Yeah, I think as we did our uh, surveying of, of, mm -hmm. around barriers, the uh, resources <laughs> was right. absolutely at the, the top of the list for uh, many medical centers that they may be interested, um, but uh, you know, not having a nurse available or the capacity to be able to uh, run a trial in addition to providing clinical care is is a is a real barrier to being able to expand it and so we we have to look for ways to make you sure that uh, as many sites as possible have the resources necessary uh, to participate in clinical trials we do need more investigators and more sites uh, in order to support um, the amount of clinical activity Colleen, I wonder if the families on might comment um, you know especially uh, David Adams um, you know, one of the barriers I've seen is missing work, right? So enrolling an adult is not the same thing as enrolling a kid after school, right? Work doesn't kind of end. And so uh, having kids and, you know, so I just wonder what David's perspective is versus uh, Casey and David Fawn about, you know, life challenges, barriers and, and getting there. Yeah, I, I guess in, in my uh, case, uh, it was really, uh, easy for me to get to CHOP. I live in the Philadelphia uh, uh, suburbs and my uh, my uh, employer uh, just was very uh, flex flexible. Uh, so it wasn't an issue for, for my uh, trial. Great. Uh, this is Dave Fawn. Uh, my daughter, Catherine, travels well. Uh, the physical aspect of traveling wasn't an issue with her, and being young, getting off school wasn't really a problem either. Uh, but that doesn't mean that travel is not a significant barrier for for us. Uh, we live in Kentucky. Um, the clinical trial we were in was in, was at the NIH in Bethesda, and. You know, it required us to travel up there several times a year uh, for multiple days at a time because there were a lot of uh, a, a lot of doctor's appointments on each visit, and that requires some flexibility. You have to one or both parent. You have to be able to take off work and travel with your child. And you know, even though the clinical trial itself is free and the travel is paid for, it's still kind of a burden at your job. Um, I, my job, I have some flexibility in terms of when I can take off, but when I'm not working, I don't get paid. Um, so, you know, it can be a financial burden to a lot of people. Um, and we, we were fortunate that we were able to do it. Um, but, but that, I think, is one of the most significant barriers to clinical trials for a lot of people is just do you have time? Can you financially afford to take off even if the plane flight's and the hotel rooms paid for, can you go a week, you know, every few months without working? It speaks to the burden of the trial design, right? How much is required? Yeah, the, um, yeah we, uh, the clinical trial we were in, there was, we had two different phases. Um, and a washout between them. One of the phases we were on a placebo, one we were on the drug. We didn't know which one uh, was which phase, but you know we had a fairly rigorous intake process. We had to go up there um, several times in the first couple months, a uh, week at a time, and then you had um, after that you would go up there every few months just for a week at a time, 
And in between visits, you would have to have uh, different kinds of uh, medical testing back home, you know, blood draws, that sort of thing. Uh, but we had to travel to the NIH over the course of a couple of years, uh, probably seven or eight times total um, and, and, you know, week periods of time each time. So, I mean, it was, it was fairly significant uh, amount of time off work. And I'll echo uh, what David and Dave said, and I, I really do believe that we should really take advantage of the telemedicine that is um, now out there um, through COVID and whatnot. Now we, uh, everyone is using it and it just makes sense that, um, that our trials um, will, can allow some uh, appointments becoming become uh, uh, telemedicine appointments. Great points, everyone. I, I really think that echoes a lot of what we see on our our day to day too, even for clinical care, <laughs> uh, getting patients the appropriate care. I do want to pose another question that was submitted. Uh, I think, Dory, this might be a good one for you. Aside from gene therapies, other alternative therapies currently being worked on in mitochondrial disease? Uh, great question. Um, so right now, um, email as well as others are trying also uh, cell-based uh, therapies. And um, consider the fact that currently there's not a, a single approved drug in the US, and so most uh, subjects uh, are getting uh, ba basically dietary supplements. Going from dietary supplements into a cell-based uh, therapy, that's that's a huge uh, a leap. Uh, also, uh, going into uh, genetic alternatives, which are developed by other companies, that is also a, a dramatic uh, change. And yet, we do feel that uh, there is a uh, room for uh, such a such an approach, I should say, and uh, Marnie knows because she was there, that the FDA, unlike what many people may think, is very flexible towards a, a cell-based uh, approach. And uh, yes, the, <clears throat> the gap that uh, we need to prove in order to go into clinic is more dramatic. But on the other hand, uh, if uh, we will be able to show the clinical translation that, that uh, they would like to, to see, there is a uh, room for uh, such an approach. Yeah, I think, you know, again, you know, Marty, uh, yeah, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think Dory has really brought up, a, you know, another important point here for the patients uh, that are on the call and caregivers, and that's there's this somewhat layered approach, right, that's now being developed around um, you know, developing treatments for, for mitochondrial disease patients. You know, as Dory said, so many of them really depend on supplements and vitamins right now as sort of a foundation. Um, but then there's sort of another layer of repurposing drugs that I know you've done a lot of work on. So a little lower regulatory bar, how can we repurpose, recycle drugs that have already been in clinic or been approved by uh, the FDA for use in mitochondrial disease? And then that next layer is where you know many of the companies on this call are active now trying to develop new forms of small molecules and treatments. And then there's those, you know, those longer ones, another layer like the cell therapies and gene therapies and base editing. Maybe, you know, Marty, it might be kind of interesting to hear your thoughts just on how all of these uh, weave together for our patient community. Yeah, I, I think, um, like I said, I get, I get the privilege of working with many of these uh, colleagues and trying to figure out where each one goes. And I think they all have special niches. If you're trying to replace a mitochondrial DNA problem, then you probably want to start with somebody with a mitochondrial DNA problem. Um, that said, could it work in all of us when we're aging and our mitochondrial DNA fail? Maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, like so the definition of a problem changes as well. So I think the science is all the stuff that you saw in Star Trek is kind of coming to fruition. People have the technologies and sort of the ability to develop a lot of creative things. And on the call today, we have 
you know, stealth who's developing a peptide, um, which is pretty neat. Oh, thank you for joining, Casey. Uh, she just wrote us that she needs to leave. Um, we have Dory developing cell therapy. We have Chris developing a drug that they really, if I could speak, Chris, were developing for old people that they thought might actually have value for mito people because of what we know about the supplements we give mito people affecting nitric oxide, and they have a drug that does it pretty well. So now you can move from a supplement to a drug. And then, of course, you have um, Alex developing a PPAR signaling modulator, um, which changes the way um, fat is used to make energy. So four really unique approaches, um, different outcomes for every single one, different populations. We want to see more and more and more trials. Um, like I said, we have uh, uh, five active intervention trials as of you know this month, which is for us like a dramatic change since 2016 when there was just one. So I think I used to think maybe a decade ago there would be one winner. There's not going to be one winner. There's going to be many and as a matter of fact, even if you could do a gene therapy, that let's say it reversed the kidney problem or the liver problem, you might still need a therapy for the heart problem or the brain problem. So oftentimes some things are common in many mito diseases, and that's gonna be awesome when we have a therapy for many problems that happen once the mitochondria fails. And some of them are gonna be very specific to your exact cause, for example, um, NUBPL, which we study, which is near and dear to Dave Fawn's heart, really affects iron. Iron might be a big deal in that disease, um, and it may or may not be in others, you know? And so I think the more we can understand, the more we could profile, the more we could use data, not just guessing, you know, um, data from the, the clinical outcomes, data from the clinic that can also be shared for clinical outcomes. Like Dory was saying, we, we work with companies to sh just share with them <laughs> the objective data they need to make decisions. Um, the, I think the, more, the closer we're getting. Our, our goal is to find a therapy for everybody. And so we would love it if we had, you know, a medicine cabinet 20 deep uh, for Dr. Goldstein to go through. And I think combination therapies, combination therapies are what treat HIV and AIDS, right? Combination therapies make a lot of sense. And in mitochondrial disease, which is the essence of life, <laughs> having different um, uh, opportunities is, is, am is amazing. Um, so like I said, there's 50 companies in the space. I'd love to see 200. Um, I, I think there's, there's opportunity for more and more you know, better therapies. I'm also, I think, a huge testament to the people on this call. We're seeing companies that are not gigantic pharma. You know, the, we're seeing companies that are incredibly dedicated to this space. We're seeing companies stick with it from pre-trial, I'm oh, sorry, pre-preclinical conception all the way through launch. To me, that's the best, right? They're really learning um, and they're really, you know, resilient and pivoting um, and not, you know, uh, and working with the families and inspired. And I think they know, just like I know and you know, there's going to be therapies. The question again is, is, is the, what's that, the matching game? Who gets which therapy when? And that's why Dr. Goldstein will have a career forever. Because uh, when, because <laughs> we need we need therapies when people are well, and then we need therapies when people are sick. Um, and I think a lot of the therapies have been for the well, relatively well, chronic, and we still need acute therapies as well. So again, to me, this is a very rich field. We're at the very beginning. I really hope everyone on this call is successful. Like I really do, it's like you want each of your children to succeed. I want every single one of these companies to win. <laughs> I want there to be therapies. And, and I think the other thing that we're seeing is much better science compared to a decade ago and really robust data that's convincing us we can treat animals. We have animals. They can get better, right? That's a, that was a huge gap that we didn't have ever. Um, so there's more compelling data. The, NI, the FDA is becoming more flexible, as you heard from Dory. Um, and um, again, I think I think we're moving together. I just think it's iterative. Uh, these conversations are essential. We need to continue to learn. We're also coming up with better biomarkers, again, better outcome measures. So I think to really get to the pinnacle, we have to keep layering it on, you know, the successes. And I think I think that's why we're so happy and grateful to partner with everybody um, because we see what the families need. But as I always say, academics don't make drugs. Right. We could tell you <laughs> where we think we need a drug and the families could tell you what they'd like to be better. But we really need life science partners uh, to come to the table. And, and the fact that they are, Phil, to me, is so inspiring. 100 percent. And I do want to just give a shout out to Tom Clow and Vince Kanzanese. I know we haven't heard from them, but I think the work they do is essential because 
while it's aspirational that we're going to get all these through the FDA, just because the therapies we can buy at a health food store um, or over the counter um, are over the counter, it doesn't mean they're not medicine. They are. And so having partners that can you know, source these, make reputable versions of these, safe versions, versions that are reliable and cost effective and bio, you know, bioavailable and uh, taste, you know, that isn't disgusting. <laughs> you know, like I think all of these are really important things to get children and adults to actually take medicines that I think Dr. Goldstein can tell you are making a difference in the standard of care. I don't know if maybe you want to end with that, Dr. Goldstein, but, you know, any, a lot of what we're doing is knowledge based, even if it's not regulatory approved. Well, I would say um, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of our colleagues around the world really struggle with supplements because they're expensive and it's too many pills. Um, and because we've partnered with a compounding pharmacy with Summit Health, um, Vince has made this process seamless for our patients. Um, we, we don't promise anybody he'll be able to get the insurance to approve it, but Vince has gone to bat for our patients and um, appealed and talked to the insurance company and we can't thank him enough for his dedication for our patients and Vince will even I mean if we have a child that gets admitted to the hospital you know the last thing a parent's thinking about when they're rushing their kid off to the ER is oh my gosh let me grab the mito cocktail out of the refrigerator we have kids that are in the ICU and the next day Vince will have a delivery at the at the door of the ICU um, so thank you Vince our, our patients are grateful we're grateful because um, as Marnie just said, we are still waiting for those acute therapies. And I think about all my Hail Marys when our kids are in that ICU. But what makes sense to us is feeding the mitochondria what we can feed them. And the cocktail is a big part of that. So thank you. So I know we're at time. Colleen and Phil, did we hit the major topics you wanted to cover? I think we have, yeah. Colleen. Absolutely. I mean, with this Thanks. group, we could talk all <laughs> night uh, without any problem. But um, I, I know I'm really um, thankful for those that participated and uh, you're particularly the patients and the caregivers that you know share their perspective on it. But we're we're thankful for everyone that has made a decision to be a part of our community, including the pharmaceutical companies. And um, we are here to partner. I think that's a message you hear clearly from CHOP and hopefully you hear from UMDF too. That's how we'll have success and um, future uh, panels will have even more exciting things to talk about, like how do we pay for these drugs once they're approved? But we'll, we'll save that one. <laughs> Again, that's a great problem to have. Again, yes. I know pharma thinks about it from day one, and I think I think you do, but <laughs> like it, it's critical. But I think um, again, I, I'm very hopeful for you know maybe an approval in 2023, 2024. But you know, I think once there's a precedent, you know, the 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 chips will fall, <laughs> the barriers will fall, and this will become. I, I think I told my team on over the weekend. My goal is so that we never have to say again, we have no FDA approved therapies for mitochondrial disease. We just need the first. And then it'll be possible and then, and then we'll get more. So I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank our extremely talented moderators, Colleen Urescu, uh, Phil Yeski, our families, uh, David Fawn, Casey Willibin, David Adams, all the lessons uh, they've learned and that their children have taught them um, um, and their experiences with trials that they've shared with us tonight. Of course, Amy Goldstein, our fearless leader, uh, you know, taking great care of patients and, you know, pushing pushing the envelope forward. You know, before we put someone in a clinical trial, we want them to be in good clinical state. And it doesn't happen without expert doctors and teams like Dr. Goldstein leads. Uh, Sarah Nguyen, of course, uh, with whom none of us uh, could develop or conduct these trials and her fearless partner, Laura McMullen uh, and our team. Um, we're now um, five coordinators under them, so a team of seven. Um, and with Colleen eight. So just really wonderful, wonderful teamwork. Um, and then of course our development colleagues, Matt Swear uh, and Maddie Breslin who, who helped plan all this this evening and really just so grateful to the uh, sponsors, Summit Health, Cyclarion, Laramar, Imel, Stealth, Reneo and Solace. Thank you so much for your support of what we do. You know, everything we do, whether it's a family funded program or a pharma donation, we put it in the central bank. We work as a team. We try to, you know, create the resources that will be leveraged 
uh, to continue to climb that ladder. And, and I, I'm really hopeful we're getting there. So thank you so much uh, to everybody, uh, especially for staying over. We will make this recording uh, live, I believe, on our website or, or post it so it, you could watch it again, maybe not live. Um, and thank you for sticking with us through our technical uh, challenges um, and have a wonderful evening and a great rest of Mito Disease Awareness Week. And on Saturday in the Philadelphia area, Colleen and Amy can tell you more, <laughs> but the whole world's going to turn green. Uh, we were inspired by UMDF. Bambi Stetler and our group made it happen. Colleen, just tell them where to look and then we'll let them go. Yeah, so you can hopefully find green landmarks all over the world with the National Light Up Green. In Philadelphia, we will have the Chop Burger Center light up green, as well as some big monuments like Boathouse Row, some of the areas near the William Penn Tower. Um, thankfully, we have green lights due to our local eagles. So we have <laughs> lots of options lighting up green here in Philadelphia. So if, you, if you're taking any pictures, share them with us. We'd love to see them. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye -bye.